Welcome to the 2023 Emma Goldman Awards. Uh, this is always an evening which is uh, enjoyable, engaging, and uh, I hope a bit of fun as well. Certainly afterwards when we uh, have our flying dinner and uh, we can all uh, chat and exchange ideas in a slightly less formal atmosphere. I want to start with a very warm welcome to the executive board of the Flax Foundation, that is, of course, Mika Ferlo and Jacqueline van der Poel. And we are waiting for the third member, Petra Meyer, but she's stuck on a train between Prague and Vienna at the moment. We hope she's going to be able to slip in unannounced uh, during the event. So this is the fourth time that the EVM uh, is proud to be hosting the Emma Goldman Awards Ceremony. Next year will be the final year of this cycle of the Emma Goldman, uh, Emma Goldman Awards. Um, so that's going to be uh, quite, a, quite a moment and we hope in some way that we'll be able to mark that. Um, but uh, that's uh, still to be uh, worked out. As you might know, um, two awardees are selected uh, each year to spend a month-long fellowship here at the EVM. During last academic year, we had two super awardees, uh, Tatev Hofanisyan from uh, Armenia, who was a, an incredibly lively presence here in the short time that she was here, and Tony Hastrup, who, since she has been here, I'm glad to say has been promoted to a professorial position at Manchester University from Stirling, which is, which is really great news. They made terrific contributions to the academic and social life here at the EVM, and I'm sure that the next two awardees will do the same. We will look forward to welcoming them both in the coming month, uh, months. As you know, the Flax Foundation's min uh, mission is to highlight researchers who dedicate their work to issues such as inequality, feminism, social justice, with the goal of steering academic research in the social sciences and humanities towards uh, these very issues. Uh, Petra, you have just she's just arrived uh, from the train, so she's with us. You haven't missed anything. Um, uh, one of the core missions of the EVM is uh, likewise the production and dissemination of knowledge about how society works and how the humanities can offer us a unique perspective in these dynamics. We're delighted to share these values and collaborate with the Flax Foundation and to help create uh, a network of energetic, interesting, engaged scholars where good and valuable research can flourish. Two years ago, we were delighted to host Stephanie Boulile, who is going to reflect on anti-racist feminism and the, culture, the cultural politics of democracy. So that is the sort of meat inside the sandwich, as it were. And uh, after that, I'm going to invite Mika Fellow to come and preside over the awards ceremony. Um, once we have concluded that, then it's the flying dinner. Welcome, Emmas, and thank you so much for having me tonight. It's absolutely incredible and a pleasure to be back. And first and foremost, I would like to thank the wonderful board of the Flax Foundation, Mika Verlou, Petra Maya, Jacqueline van der Poel, and the team at the IVM for hosting us, especially Casper and Marina for the smooth organization and for getting here. And before I say anything else, I would like to congratulate this year's Emma Goldman awardees and Snowball awardees. These awards are life changing. When I was here two years ago, it was a very surreal experience and I had absolutely no idea how much this prize would affect my life and also what incredible community I would become part of, starting with my own cohort, with the board, but also with the awardees from the other years. 
And every year when new awardees are chosen, both by the board and through the Snowball Awards, it is an honor to our community. You all make us proud. Every one of you represents additional critical and pressing perspectives and contributions from academia, activism, journalism, and cultural production. And we see you, we celebrate you, and we have the privilege of welcoming you to our community, which is now your community. So when... Yeah. <laughs> When Mika called me this summer and asked me to say a few critical words tonight, maybe even provocative, depending on your standpoint, I was of course game. What I'm speaking about tonight stems from my own Emma Goldman project, which is a theoretical project, of course, for anti-racist feminisms. I think it's, it's fair to say that within as a discipline, claims the discursive authority over democracy. And even when we turn to philosophy or political philosophy, we always end up with the same canon of dead white men, which I personally don't find that interesting. So since receiving this award, I have been trying to think about democracy differently. And it has been quite a journey. And I hope I can provide you with some insight into my musings tonight. When I speak about democracy tonight, I speak to its cultural politics. Conventional understandings of politics shape our understanding of democracy. Democracy is thought of as a mode of governance and as a way to rule through the will of the people, and it has become a moral principle tied in with liberalism and universalism. In this, democracy has also become a symbolic marker of progress and a moral standard. It's a standard the most economically powerful nations in the global North and West adhere to. And of course, turning to democracy theories, the term is much more contested than its public use would imply. Outside of political science, democracy has increasingly been theorized as a symbolic framework that is informed by paradoxical politics. As a political project, it is contingent on both symbolic and material politics. And I am particularly interested in this symbolic um, dimension. So when I speak about cultural politics, I want to take the symbolic level seriously. And cultural politics as an analytical lens allow me to do so because as an analytic, they render visible the symbolic situatedness of political practices or the conditions of possibility. And cultural politics inform what is permissible. Cultural politics are at play when contestations occur over meaning and efforts are undertaken to convince others of the legitimacy or illegitimacy of a course of action in particular circumstances. And I'm following Carl Grayson here. So when I look at the cultural politics of democracy and what they mean for anti-racist feminisms, I am interested in discursive constructions of democracy, contestations around the meanings of democracy, and what that means for anti-racist feminisms. Now, what do I mean by anti-racist feminisms? Now, when we hear the term white feminism, most of us have a reaction to it. We roll our eyes. Um, so there is a shared understanding of it assuming a unitary subject woman and all sorts of indifferent and exclusive politics that derive from that. I would also say that there are different branches of white feminism with at times antagonistic political investments. But how, on the other hand, can we think of anti-racist feminisms at a meta level while being mindful that there are a myriad of anti-racist feminisms transnationally? as follows. Anti-racist feminisms are based on coalition politics are invested in recovering 
negotiating gendered subjectivities in relation to humanity, because that is precisely what racialized subjects, particularly women of color, have been denied systems of oppression. In contrast to white feminism, they refuse to base themselves on a shared unitary or universal subject or identity, such as woman. And in terms of themes, anti-racist feminisms are often concerned with questions of freedom in addition to these questions of, of humanity and subjectivity. And I see my project as part of an emerging intellectual feminist movement that is deeply concerned with the global rise of authoritarianism, reactionary politics and fascism. With my own regional expertise, I can only speak to the rise of authoritarianism in the global north and west, particularly Western Europe, and I think my critique can easily be extended to North America, too. In many of these debates around the rise of authoritarianism, democracy is advanced as the natural home of feminism and progressive politics. However, what I'm arguing tonight is that not all feminisms are considered to be a natural extension of democracy. In contrary, hegemonic representations of democracy are highly selective in what they consider democratic feminisms. As anti-racist feminisms are gaining symbolic power in the form of representation on both sides of the Atlantic, a storm is brewing in North America and Europe. The hard fought for growing representation of feminists of color in politics and culture is met with intellectual resistance from academic and public commentators from left to right. And what is important to note is that it is not just the far right that is doing this. Although the far right has successfully and over and over again transnationally mainstreamed their reactionary figures and terms across the political spectrum. Besides the notion of political correctness, they have provided us with new terms that deride social justice struggles. From the figure of the millennial snowflake, we are now on to cancel culture and its little sibling call-out culture. And anti-racist feminists are particularly popular canvases of... Now, I don't want to speak about cancel culture. I think it will go away. Um, like the snowflake did, and a new term will pop up. But I do believe that political correctness, which has stuck around for almost 30 years, the snowflake and the cancel culture, stand in for broader and, in fact, very mainstream ideas about democracy. And over the past years, I have read countless academic essays, some, unfortunately, authored by gender study scholars, magazine articles, books, and journalistic that somehow identify anti-racist feminisms as the downfall of European and North American democratic culture. And despite their at times antagonistic political commitments, those who resist anti-racist feminisms muse similar diagnosis. In these analyses, anti-racist feminisms are a danger to free speech and academic freedom, they are part of the polarization panic, and they are identified as identity politics and with that as essentialist and divisive. For feminist and left critics, they curb left-wing organizing or are a distraction from the real material woes of our time. For liberals and centrists, anti-racist feminisms are an indicator of polarization, and for nearly everyone, they are exclusive or even discriminatory and often harmful to free speech. Anti-racist feminisms become a disruption or threat to what is deemed constructive democratic culture. So in my exploration of how anti-racist feminisms in Europe are constructed as threats within the cultural politics of democracy, I have identified three debates that currently frame anti-racist feminisms as dangerous to democratic culture. The free speech debate, the polarization debate, and the identity politics debate. And these debates are, of course, connected. But what I find interesting is that they have been recurring through time and that they are relational. 
So they don't stop at national borders, but assume local meanings. Therefore, I quickly want to engage with some of their underlying ideas because they transcend particular political camps, geographical contexts, and moments in time. And I think this is how they accumulate their power, and it is what makes and what will continue to make the cultural politics of democracy so ambivalent for anti-racist feminisms. And I begin with the free speech debate. In his book, Is Free Speech Racist? Gavin Titley argues that free speech is a political discourse and cultural imaginary. Free speech debates are dominated by a market model in the sense of a competition that leads to truth. At the same time, free speech operates as a metaphor for democratic exchange. Gavin argues that there is the assumption that racism can be defeated in the marketplace of ideas. And the refusal to engage with racist ideas is, a ref is seen as a refusal of democratic values and procedure. And this is where anti-racist feminisms clash with the symbolic politics surrounding democracy in the case of free speech debates. They refuse this marketplace of ideas where everything can be said and discussed. But now, how do they do that? I would argue that anti-racist feminisms are theoretically informed by standpoint theory. Now, following Patricia Hill Collings, standpoint theory argues that ideas matter in systems of power. In this sense, standpoints may be judged not only by their epistemological contributions, but also by the terms of their participation in hierarchical power relations. Do they inherently explain and condone injustice, or do they challenge it? Do they participate in rela relations of rule via create creating knowledge, or do they reject such rule by generating cultures of resistance? Refusal is a central means of resistance in anti-racist feminisms. For Akugo Emachulu and Ines van der Scher, Refusal is both a theory and a practice that rejects the hegemonic politics and political identities imposed on racialized and colonial subjects. And while it takes many forms, it can serve as a revolutionary and collective act of becoming, and they draw on Audra Simpson here. Sarah Ahmed connects refusal to willfulness when she says that to be willful is to refuse what we might call the reproductive duty as the duty of a part to reproduce the whole or at least to be willing to participate in reproduction. In that sense, anti-racist feminists become those who are in the way in Ahmed's terms. When anti-racist feminisms refuse the reproduction of sexism and racism in the name of democracy, they are seen as censoring and infringing freedoms. Gavin Titley argues that in free speech debates, the right to express racist ideas is marked out as most at stake in relation to free speech. And he writes, The liberal emphasis on free speech as an unhindered speech in the public domain elides how forms of closure are always at work across scales and domains of communication. And by closure, he means that closure on the definition of racism is needed in order to promote the general openness of free, s free expression. And what this requires is a post-racial, or at least an anti-racialist definition of racism as a phenomenon of the past without any structural dimension whereby racism becomes just an opinion on the marketplace of ideas. So in summary, how do free speech debates construct anti-racist feminisms as dangerous to democracy? Anti-racist feminisms refuse the marketplace of ideas in multiple ways. They contest its underlying post-racial and anti-racialist conceptions of racism, while at the same time refusing the reproduction of racism in the public sphere. They are therefore staged as actors of censorship. Now for the second debate, the polarization debate, and that's the one that annoys me the most. I am starting with Chantal Mouffe here, 
And she argues that in the deliberative model of democracy, the very condition for the creation of consensus is the elimination of pluralism from the public sphere. This requires that reason and rational argumentation are prioritized over division and conflict on the marketplace of ideas. Now, the problem here is, and I'm following a move, that consensus in a liberal democratic society is and will always be the expression of a hegemony and the crystallization of power relations. And I would argue that the current polarization debate that has also taken multiple academic disciplines by storm is firstly heavily informed by deliberative democratic models and secondly takes centrism as its normative assumption. I'm arguing this because polarization debates suggest an equivalence between social justice or progressive positions on the one hand and far-right positions on the other hand. In this, they uphold an equivalence between positions that deny certain subjects' humanity and those who claim it or contest dehumanization. In other words, they are indifferent to the very significant question of who is actually considered human in those debates. And this indifference is informed by an investment in a universalist conception of democracy, which is based on a liberal understanding of equality, which assumes that every human is equal to every other human. Now, anti-racist feminists are not known for buying into liberal fairy tales. Anti-racist feminist th theories have extensively dealt with the historical exclusion of non-white subjects from humanity. Therefore, and unsurprisingly, they reject universal assumptions of humanity as a basis of democratic politics as naive. In her new book, Fugitive Feminisms, Akugo Emichulu argues that whiteness self-serving and self-mythologizing is positioned not merely as embodying the ideal futures of humanity, it is constructed as humanity itself. Drawing on Sylvia Winter, Emma Chulu argues that the category of human is linked to care and solidarity, who we identify with, who we see ourselves in community with, who we extend our care to. Racism, as the politics of the human in relation to care and death, is the foundational social relation between human and non-human others. Polarization debates are completely indifferent to the ways racism excludes certain subjects from humanity. In this, polarization debates depoliticize and misrecognize anti-racist feminist standpoints. This indifference to inequalities is written into polarization models that are advanced by political science. One dominant trope is this reduction of um, political positions to partisan interests, which then um, are assumed to become social identities, which then lead to effective polarization. And from a sociological standpoint, this analytical chain, partisan interests leading to social identities and subsequently to emotional politics is questionable. There seems very little attention to social structures and inequalities in these models. Nevertheless, polarization theories are currently pumped out of academia back into the public sphere and they stick because they fit the centrist and liberal political narratives that surround symbolic representations of democracy, which are informed by the deliberative democracy models as the ideal. So coming back to anti-racist feminisms, we have already established that refusing dominant stories is an act of resistance. So is counter-storytelling. However, when these stories are depoliticized as partisan interests, anti-racist feminisms are staged as dangerous to democracy for refusing liberal conceptions of equality, i.e. every human is equal, and challenge the centrist equivalence between racist positions that dehumanize and anti-racist positions that oppose these modes of dehumanization. And now, last but not least, the identity politics debate. And this is the third debate that constructs anti-racist feminisms as a threat to democracy. 
I would argue that its success rides on the fact that anti-racist feminisms violate what Emma Chulu calls hyper-individualism under racial capitalism. Emma Chulu argues that a liberal democratic imagination is invested in a hierarchy between the free autonomous individual and the suffocating collective. I have stated before that anti-racist feminisms are epistemologically tied to standpoint theory. Following Patricia Hill Collins, a standpoint refers to historically shared group-based experiences. However, unlike often suggested in identity politics debates that diagnose standpoint political projects with narcissism, standpoint theory, so Collins, focuses on the social conditions that bring historically marginalized groups into being. The current identity politics debate is dominated by liberalism. Liberal understandings of freedom argue that freedom occurs when individuals have rights of mobility in and out of groups, much as we join clubs or other voluntary associations. A standpoint, on the other hand, identifies a group based on shared histories due to their positioning in power relations. From these shared placings and hierarchies, groups share common experiences. And of course, not everyone in a group will have the exact same experiences, and they will also be interpreted differently at an individual level, but that is another question. Now, following Collins, the misrecognition of standpoint-based politics occurs when a standpoint is put forward as a collective decision to associate with a particular group and an identity is forged based on that voluntary association. The basis of this liberal misrecognition is the understanding that groups are an accumulation of individuals who themselves are all unique. However, Collins argues that race, gender, social class, ethnicity, age, and sexuality are not descriptive categories of identity applied to individuals. Instead, these elements of social structure emerge as fundamental devices that foster inequality resulting in groups. So the identity politics debate is dominated by a profound misrecognition of how inequalities inform group identities. Group consciousness that emerges from a negotiation and interpretation of those power structures and resulting group self-definitions are thereby quickly dismissed as a self-fashioning in the sense of a voluntary association. In opposition to these liberal musings, Emma Chulu argues that communities that emerge out of group consciousness can be spaces of radical experimentation for our social relations. Especially feminist political projects refuse dominant liberal understandings of, of autonomy in favor of dependency and vulnerability. In this, they are positioned against liberal epistemologies. Emma Chulu proposes radical care as a basis of anti-racist feminisms. Radical care to her is a practice of recognizing others who are also excluded from humanity as fellow fugitives and work towards a framework for identifying their needs and a series of caregiving actions, caring labor, to ensure that those meet, needs are met. Through practices of solidarity and care, anti-racist feminisms therefore violate hyper-individualism under racial capitalism. So at the heart of the identity politics debate is a deep-seated failure to understand group consciousness as a product of social structures and an inability or maybe unwillingness to move beyond methodological individualism. So in conclusion, anti-racist feminisms refuse individualism, which according to Collins, continues as a taproot in Western theorizing, including feminist versions. And she mentions individual rights, the celebration of human difference, market-based choice models, which she all subsumes under bourgeois liberalism. So if we argue that the cultural politics of democracy heavily revolve around this bourgeois liberalism, we can argue that as long as anti-racist feminisms refuse its logics, they are seen as a threat. 
as soon as they start nodding to it, and there are instances of that in the corporate sector, within the EU, and of course in popular culture, they can become part of the politics that are privileged in symbolic debates surrounding democracy. And while these moments of incorporation or reform produce an ambivalence that of course merits critical engagement and maybe even reparative readings, I believe there is merit in paying attention to anti-racist feminisms that do not simply accept the uneven power relations conveyed to us by the cultural politics of democracy as we know them, but that refuse their logics, create alternative political visions or practices that contest, rework, or abandon democracy as we know it. Thank you. Okay. Climb on here. Um, we get to a next part of the ceremony. It's not my favorite part because I do enjoy listening to great speeches and I'm always enjoying to be in this uh, library where I was speaking for the first time in 2001 which was a life-changing experience for me. Like, how did I get here that I can speak here, right? So I know that kind of feeling. And it was the exact same setting. This is a gorgeous environment and it's been like that since before the century, probably, but I wasn't here then. <laughs> so thank you, Susan Zimmerman, um, for your very sophisticated analysis showing that um, Whatever women activists have in common, the broader social context is causing some trouble in how they can define both the activism and the outcomes of it, right? And uh, Stephanie, thank you very much for this uh, talk. It was absolutely wonderful. And I think everyone under understood and enjoyed it. And as Flax Foundation, we're especially also very pleased that you put such a great focus on one of our first awardees, Akugo Imajuru, uh, which is wonderful. So it testifies to that there is some kind of spirit around all this. And um, now to, to make some more spirit and joy, um, I want to start with uh, Emma Goldman's Snowball Awards. So there's maybe people in the room that don't know what is a snowball award, right? It's really very hot. <laughs> and the snowflakes have already disappeared. So but the snowballs have not disappeared. And I think you can, you can look at snowballs in different ways. Now you start with a small one and you roll it, right? And then it becomes bigger and bigger. We like that as a metaphor. Um, you can also, in case some people are really annoy you, you can throw a snowball at them. We like that image too. <laughs> so there's probably also images or metaphors around snowballs that aren't so positive, but uh, we like these two and that's enough for us. So the snowball awardees are chosen by the Emma Goldman Awards of last year. So I will also mention uh, who was nominating them. And we start with them. And we, we always choose some kind of order uh, because we have no preference. The whole board is fully behind the seven of them that were chosen. Um, so we decided this time to do them in alphabetical order of, I think, first name. <laughs> so um, the first one is Dunya uh, Burabain. And um, she's a very, very talented Belgian researcher with Moroccan background, working currently already as assistant professor at the University of Hasselt uh, in Belgium, in Flanders. She has a very strong track record with several awards to her name already, although she only defended her dissertation recently. 
Her dissertation is on everyday sexism and racism in the ivory tower. We didn't, she didn't choose the EVM, no? Maybe. But I think, I mean, I don't know. You never know before you research what you're going to find. Uh, maybe it would be very rosy up here, we don't know. So it's about the struggles and resistance of women early career researchers in Belgium. She defended it recently at uh, VUB in Brussels after studying migration studies in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. She didn't study only everyday racism and sexism in higher education, though. She also studied it in clothing stores. Uh, if it's everyday, let's go to the everyday institutions and in primary education. And she constructed a typology of forms of everyday racism in the academic workplace that we hope with her, probably, and with many others, can be useful to, um, to many academic uh, places. In addition, she paid attention to the specific socialization process of women of color in the academic workplace and their strategies to navigate this place. She's very active and visible in European-level communities that fight sexism and racism in academia, and I've also met her around in these places. With her expertise in different fields of inequality, one of her passions is in strong sociological theory, such as social complexity theory, which is another very strong asset, I think. She's also passionate about focusing her research to the wider public, giving less guest lectures, conference presentations, engaging in panel discussions on race and gender inequality, on discrimination, on racism. And she strives to be the professor that she wishes she had when she was studying. And we fully believe that she will succeed in this. Dunya, can I ask you to come here? If you stand there, I'll, I, have to, I have to pick up your award. So. Oops. I think you're in the totally down there. Yes. OK. So on behalf of the Flax Foundation, can I offer you this Snowball Award? Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> okay, next up is Elena Biagini. And she's an activist and independent researcher with a PhD in gender studies from Sapienza University in Rome. Also teaches at an Italian public secondary school. So, it's um, a bit of a tradition, apparently, with the Flax Foundation, that we seem to find many independent researchers that are very good. And the same goes for the Snowball Awardees. She's one of the rare and leading researchers in the field of lesbian feminist studies in Italy. She's played a critical role as a well-known lesbian activist in the making of the Italian movement, especially in the more radical, intersectional and queer branch. Several lesbian groups and in the Fasciamo Brescia, if I pronounce that right, and Novat movements in the 20s against the hegemony of the Vatican. I know the Vatican has long arms across the world, but if you're in Italy, they're particularly close. Um, Fasciamo Brescia introduced a critique of the homonormativity and homonationalism that had defined the action of mainstream organization in those years. And this resonates a bit with your warning at the end of your talk, of course. She's also conducted for several years a radio program, Profonda Rosa, which means deeply pink, for the online radio Radio Onda, several, edited several works and collaborated to the Italian Feminist Journal. Her PhD thesis, based on work in time outside of her teaching job, right? This comes with being an independent researcher. It's a, a monograph, the an unexpected emergence, the lesbian movement in Italy in the 70s and 80s. And it was the first scientific and rigorous contribution to the history of lesbian movements in Italy. An independent contribution for researchers and activists. Without her contribution, this world of movement and activism would still be publicly invisible. 
So if you come slowly, I can pick up your award in time to give it to you, <laughs> Elena. <laughs> ah, super. Elena, you deserve this. Where is the photographer? Over there. So, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. You deserve it. <laughs> okay, we move to Katerina Zarembo. Are you sitting? Yeah. As you can maybe guess from her name, She's a Ukrainian, policy analyst, university lecturer, writer, and mother of four. This you didn't know, right? She defended her uh, PhD in 2016 and combined teaching in Ukraine with working as a guest researcher at, uh, in Darmstadt, this time in, in Germany, as so many other, other uh, Ukrainian uh, scholars writing an important book, mothering four children in a new country, advocating for Ukraine across the globe from Canada to Italy. Elena, she speaks Italian. Her work is crucial for current understanding of inequalities in Ukraine. Um, she addresses the processes of polarization in Ukrainian society. She does this in particular in her recently published book on Ukrainian civil society activism in the Donbas. It's called The Rise of Ukraine's Sun, Stories of Donetsk Region and Lukans Region at the Beginning of the 21st Century. Written in 2022 during the full-scale invasion. She's currently promoting this book with a book tour in various Ukrainian cities. Katerina is very vocal in discussing the problems of women with children in academia. Susan is not just, you know, in the metal industry. There's apparently some parallels there. Uh, and has worked as a coach speaking about self-care, where to find support, how to survive with children in forced immigration. Her chapter on parenthood in terms of war and expectations put on the shoulders of women who had to leave their countries and their partners ended up alone with their kids in foreign countries and auto-ethnography, will be published soon in an edited volume on the war in Ukraine. So, Katarina, can I ask you to come here? Thank you. We're very happy to give you this award. You deserve it. Thank you very much. We always travel countries with these awards, and now we travel to Hungary. Maria Takac. And Maria Takac is a Hungarian documentary director, video journalist, civil activist, educated at the Hungarian Film Academy, with a double major in history and geography. She's worked for Hungarian television until <laughs> It matters with Hungary, until when, right? Until 2008, and for the press. She has been making videos and documentaries for NGOs for 20 years, mainly for Hungarian LGBTQ and other civil communities. She was a member of the selection committee and event coordinator at Versio International Human Rights Documentary Film Festival. She's a founding member of the Labris Lesbian Organization and the Budapest Lesbian Film Committee. She organizes a feminist film club, and her mission is to raise awareness and support human rights through film. Among her documentaries, we like her 2021, Game On, Queer Disruptions in Sport. I see someone sitting there who liked that too, probably. Awarded three prizes at various festivals and her 2015 one entitled Hot Men Called Dic Dictatorships. She's not just good at films, right? She's also quite good at titles. Uh, awarded prizes in Romania and Jakarta. This last documentary on how Hungarian society and state have been treating gays and on changing changes in gays' personal experiences of social and political oppression since communism is very timely. It's eight years ago. Uh, given that today the political system is getting very similar to previous dictatorships. 
She has a profound interest in life stories and a belief that showing the life of a human being is more interesting and valuable than an Oscar-winning feature film. Maria Takac, can I ask you to receive your award? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> So it's a very nice to now move to Talat Jakub, who is from Scotland. A Scottish campaigner, trainer, writer, commentator, focused on women's equality, race equality, intersectional analysis of policies. She's educated in Scotland too, so you're very, very Scottish. <laughs> She's an independent consultant and commentator. She is also quite full of initiatives. Reading her CV is more like reading someone that is a volcano of initiatives. Would that sound familiar, maybe? She was launched past the mic in October 29, the first and only directory of women of color and experts in Scotland. She was the director of Equit Scotland from 2016 to 2020, working on women's equality across the STEM sectors. And then she also conducted the first intersectional analysis of women's experiences in STEM in Scotland. She co-founded the Women 5050 group and uh, chaired this cross-party campaign group. Um, she's also a member of the First Minister's Advisory Council on Women and Girls since 2017 and was co-chair. There's also like a pattern. She does something and then she becomes the chair. I don't know. Says something. She's a member of Gender Equal Media, Scotland, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission. She's an award-winning blog writer and was awarded the Outstanding Women of Scotland Award from the Saltire Society. And then she was also made a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I don't know, I think Bridgerton series when I read something like Royal Society. So maybe, maybe that's not the worst <laughs> Maybe that's not the worst connotation, I'm not sure about that. Um, and a mural of her was cited in Edinburgh as part of a celebration of women in STEM in 2021. So we're not totally sure she needs another award, maybe, <laughs> but that faith she has in common with people, and you have to, you know, why end it if people continue to do good things, no? <laughs> Thank you, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't it amazing, all these people that we find? So, I mentioned this sports documentary, and I moved to Verity Smith. Uh, Verity is a gay disabled trans man who played elite women's rugby for a number of years, and now plays in the wheelchair uh, rugby league, U UK Super League, so top athlete, right? He played a number of other sports in the past too, including association football, ice hockey, Thai boxing. Most importantly, I'm not a sports person. I apologized already to Verity for that. He's a leading voice on trans inclusion in sports in the UK and also supports diversity and inclusion for International Gay Ruby and the Federation of Gay Games. He works uh, for Mermaids as Mermaids Youth Engagement Manager. He's passionate that all young people should have access to sport, believing in education, not discrimination. And given the transphobia he has experienced, and I hope not, but maybe still is experiencing, while engaging in sports as a trans man, his firm position in believing in education and dedicating himself to working with youngsters is testimony to the great person he is. He takes his history and background and what's happened to him and turns that into a positive story to make sure that all children have access to sport. He works closely with sports clubs, national governing bodies, local clubs to help support and bridge the gaps for trans, non-binary and gender diverse young people. So that it doesn't matter whether you're trans, whether you're disabled, whether you're able-bodied, 
your background, where you come from, but you can engage in sports. Feridi, we have an award for you. Thank you. For you, a little snowball. <laughs> okay, we have one more snowball to go. And this is in Abshentek. Yep. <laughs> um, Sinep is a, a Turkish investigative journalist specializing in human rights and corruption with a PhD from Heidelberg University. And she's been researching and writing for several leading media around the world. Der Spiegel, NRC, uh, Le Soir, Vice, Politico, and many others for a decade. And her reporting was awarded and shortlisted for various journalism awards. She promoted feminist cross-border investigative journalism in various settings, including in the Global jo Journalist Conference and the Topfer Foundation's European, European Journalism Program. She teaches also investigative techniques to early career journalists in Turkey, as well as in wider Europe, showing how investigative methods can be used to not just do gender reporting, but also uncover real threats to women and LGBTQ rights. Prior to that, she was the managing editor of the independent investigative news platform, The Black Sea. The Black Sea played a big role in the pan-European cross-border journalism network, uh, where her small team led several prominent projects. Realizing that she was only one of the few women journalists participating in the network, she successfully pushed to codify gender equality in this organization's partnership agreement. And she also served as a board member for the organization. So thank you for all what you have done, and please come and accept your award. Voila. Congratulations. Okay, now we come to the snowball, to, from the snowball to the Emma Goldman Awards, and then these people will roll a little tiny snowball to others, right? Although maybe at this moment they're a bit terrified that they have to choose people for that. But we'll, we'll help them tomorrow with that. So this time I think I will do them in alphabetical order from the last name, starting with Teresa Dekenhardt. And, um, yeah, you, you will see, all these people are just plain wonderful. And I could have said that with the previous seven, um, but it occurs to me now that, in fact, the best thing would be to, that you could listen to all of them, like for a longer time, but we don't have enough time for that. So please remember their names, check them, ask them to speak somewhere, do whatever you, you feel like from that. So there, there is a Degenhardt, she has uh, a law degree. So for the Flax Foundation, we are not very strong on law degree people yet. So we are very happy to have found a good person to give an award to. Um, she has a background in law, but from University of Bologna, from Kiel and from Ulster University. Um, she has held also visiting uh, positions in Berkeley, Hamburg, Turin, and as a student also in New York and Rotterdam and Utrecht. Um, based on an interest in investigating social and institutional reactions to behavior deemed criminal or harmful within a transnational and international context, she turned to study state policies on migration, focusing on the use of detention through an abolitionist perspective. She also looked at the management of migrants in immigration detention in the UK during the first lockdown for COVID-19. She's currently based in Belfast. Her Routledge book, War as Protection and Punishment, Armed Intervention at the End of History, analyzes the punitive use of military force in the post-9-11 war on terror context 
with particular reference to the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. It looks at the use of war, or the threat of it, as a means of punishing and establishing order, thus defining borders in the international sphere. The book is important, as you were all already thinking, hearing this, because it's focused on the punitive logics behind the so-called liberal military interventions rings a bell until now. It also did so in Kosovo, in Iraq and Libya. The book also explores how these operations aimed at disciplining local state institutions with the aim of governing the total population, the local population. And through this analysis, it shows the contradictions and ambiguities that these military interventions created in the local areas. In the past, she worked on second generation migrants, on prostitutions, theoretically on some criminalizing, victimizing feminist understandings of prostitution, and empirically on crimes committed against female migrants by criminal organizations in the context of Italy's restrictive migration regimes. So maybe you also speak Italian. Do you? Okay. Yeah. There is always like this secret multitudes among the oldies. She's also part of the Lever Home Interdisciplinary Networks on Algorithmic Solutions. So this is just a little hint, like, don't think she only looks at migration, she does these other things as well, but I didn't highlight everything, just this. Teresa, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> So now only six people are nervous, right? So it gets really relaxed in the room almost, no? Eight people are not nervous anymore. They've been there. So Eva Maria Fjellheim um, is a South Sami researcher, activist and radio documentary producer from the Norwegian side of Sami. This is the ancestral lands of the indigenous Sami people, which stretch across Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Her work centers around indigenous peoples' rights, grassroots, and territorial struggles in Sápmi and abroad, especially in Latin America. She is still a PhD research fellow at the Center for Sámi Studies at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. And what she does there, her research project, concerns the expression of what she calls, and other people maybe also know, green colonialism, through the expansion of the wind power industry on Sami reindeer herding lands. For the Sami and their reindeer husbandry, wind power is neither green nor progress. It's just another industry that's gradually fragmenting the Sami cultural landscape. And research is one of the many tools for Sami and indigenous peoples to pursue self-determination and emancipation from colonial injustice. Next to writing this dissertation, she works at the Sami Council for the EU unit, where she works with research issues. Her recent article, You Can Kill Us With Dialogue, resonates with Stephanie's talk. It's called You Can Kill Us With Dialogue, Critical Perspectives on Wind Energy Development in a Nordic Sami Green Colonial Context. It's in Human Rights Review. It draws on ethnography from a consultation meeting, meeting between Jelen Jarke, the impacted reindeer herding community, and the state authorities. The study suggests that the state and corporate-led dialogues displaced the root cause of the conflict, revealed epistemic miscommunication, and perpetuated relations of domination, which limited emancipatory effects for Jelen Jarke. So the premises and the discourses underpinning these dialogues further reproduced racist notions which devalue ancestral Sami reindeer herding knowledges, practices, and landscape relations. These findings challenge dialogues, so it's a good case, challenge dialogues as prescription of good governance and conflict resolution in a context where democracy and compliance with indigenous people's rights are perceived as high. 
So thank you very much for what you have already done. We believe in your future potential and please come and accept your award. So good to have you here. Thank you. Okay. Eva Majewska is a feminist philosopher and critical theorist of culture, professor at uh, SWPS University in Warsaw, working on feminist anti-fascism, counterpublics and dialectics of the week. She's also PI in the Queer Studies Archive Theory Project, Public Against Their Will, the production of subjects in the archives of Hyacinth Actions. She's a prolific writer with seven books, including the recent and very dear to my heart in any case, Feminist Anti-Fascism, Counterpublics of the Common, and articles in many journals and collected volumes. Her PhD in social philosophy and her recent habilitation in cultural studies are from the University of Warsaw. But she also held temporary or visiting positions in Berlin, Warsaw, Krakow, Berkeley, and was a senior visiting fellow at the Institute in Vienna 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago. She currently co-curates the exhibition of Mariola Przyzemska's work at Warsaw Sarceta Gallery. She's a committee member of the Utopian Studies Society. I didn't know it existed, but I think I will apply for membership. <laughs> and uh, it's a European interdisciplinary association devoted to the study of utopianism in all its forms. In her work, she makes solid links with feminists not often referred to in Europe, such as Chicana feminism including Gloria and Zwalda, to address the brutalism that has made visible the events taking place on the east border in Poland. Since 2004, also the east border of the European Union, with all its tragic repercussions and many deaths. While the Russian invasion in Ukraine made the Polish-Ukrainian border a welcoming zone for war refugees who happened to fulfill the racist criteria of whiteness, the Polish-Belarusian border is now a brutal form of state exception, many officially recognized and many not even recognized deaths of the mainly non-European refugees trying to cross the border. Maybe also to counter these horrors, she also published poetry. You can see this, like multiple talents, is also an ongoing mantra through all our awardees. She published poetry, notably dating in times of the pandemic. Where were you with this poetry when we needed it, right? So, with a wonderful title, Corona Fuga. So, Eva, thank you for all what you have been doing, and we hope you just continue. <laughs> Yeah. I would like to shake your hand first. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Yep. And thank you so much. <laughs> I think now we have four nervous people. We're getting there. Esther Farsa is a social historian. We try to diversify our disciplines a little bit. Uh, with a PhD in Comparative Gender Studies from CU in Budapest. Currently working in Susan Zimmerman's uh, project. This is a bit of an accident. Um, in fact, she was chosen first and then we asked Susan. In this project, she studies women's labor activism in the agrarian socialist movements in Hungary and internationally between the late 19th century and the 1930s. Discovering, isn't that wonderful that, you know, we can't discover continents or countries anymore, but historians, they discover, they still discover. Then there are some archives and they look at them very closely and then they really discover. It's a very nice discipline in that. 
So she discovered the hitherto completely unexplored role of anarchist, socialist, and other landless peasant women in these movements, and the solidarity, but also conflicts, of women across class and ethnic divide in these movements. Before she did this, she was a Marie Curie Fellow in Regensburg and a Romani Rose Fellow at the Research Center on Anti-Gypsyism, -gypsy very strange word, in Heidelberg. Throughout her career, she has embedded her work on Hungarian and Central European history in a dense network of pan-European and transnational research, putting center stage to the connection between gender analysis and material inequality and the study of the position of the Roma population. <coughs> Next to articles, she also co-edited a special issue on reproductive politics and sex education in Cold War Europe. So this often a bit the forgotten side of what happened in the Cold War Europe. Her 2021 book, Protected Children, Regulated Mothers, examines child protection measures in Stalinist Hungary as a part of 20th century European history. Across the communist bloc, residential homes were preferred to foster care. And she argues that this state care was a tool of totalitarian regime regulating the behavior of children, not only, but also regulating lone mothers' sexuality and their entrance to paid work. Her original research was based on hundreds of children's case files and interviews with institution leaders, teachers, people formerly in state care. And a major finding of the book is that child protection had a centuries-long common history with what is called the solution to the gypsy question, rooted in efforts towards the erasure of the perceived work shyness of the gypsies. So you can see that historians, they spend lots of time in dusty archives, but by no means does that mean that they are dusty people or come to dusty books. So thank you very much for your work. Please continue. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a totally different subtopic now. Katarzyna Wojtka is Associate Professor at the University of Gothenburg, Sociology. She's also, and that's significant for the rest of what I will say about her, editor-in-chief of NORMA, the International Journal for Masculinity Studies. It's the one and only leading journal for this. In the past, she's also held postdoctoral positions at Leeds and at Humboldt University. She worked at DESIM. Maybe some people know DESIM. This is the Deutsche Zentrum for Integrations and Migrationsforschung, and at DESENS, which is the Institute for Bildung und Forschung in Berlin. She studies sociology, gender studies in Poland, Germany, the US, and Spain. And while her interests are wide, sociology of gender, critical studies on men and masculinities, social movement studies, migration studies, European studies, the puzzles of men and masculinities are a big chunk of her scholarly work. Her PhD thesis from Krakow was on men's social movement in Poland. She founded the first course on the sociology of masculinities in Poland and is co-editor of one of the few sociological books on men and masculinities in Poland, as well as of three special issues on this topic in Europe. She's worked in over a dozen research projects on gender and men and masculinities issues and published over 50 scientific articles. I cannot say prolific all the time, no? Sometimes I have to do the count no, to make, keep you a bit entertained, I think, if, what is prolific then more or less? I don't know, find out, <laughs> no? So I think it's also no surprise then that she has a website called Dr. K and the Man. So if you want to know more about that part of her work, check that website. I think she has something else in common then with other people, which is a sense of humor, maybe? With you could see that from certain things I was telling about people. Currently, she continues working on puzzles of masculinities, uh, but she started new work on European queer memorials, uh, starting from Homo Monument to HBTQI Memorial in Gothenburg, so local. 
And this project studies citizens' perceptions of the first Swedish queer monument created by artist Connie Larsen Gundrens that will be installed in Gothenburg. It's not yet installed, no? In 2023. And, it, and she also studied its connection to the broader European context. So she's currently doing what she does best, qualitative social research, interviews, observation, visual material, in nine European cities with the most prominent queer monuments, as well as in the city of Gothenburg, after this memorial will finally be there. Right? So we hope she will do whatever more her heart uh, desires. And please come and <laughs> accept your award. Thank you. Thank you for everything. <laughs> I think we have to, to, to shift to Zoom now, because our last two awardees are not here um, for different reasons. So this is Akansha Mehta. Um, welcome, Akansha. You will be here some other time, I'm sure. Um, she's a feminist educator, researcher, writer, photographer, and organizer. She's lecturer in gender, race, and cultural studies, and co-director of the Center for Feminist Research at Goldsmiths in London. She's finishing a monograph based on her ethnographic research with right-wing women in the Hindu nationalist movement in India and the Israeli Zionist settler project in Palestine. You have noticed no, that the people who get awards, they are really, really deeply engaged with serious questions of our societies. And, and I mean, Akanksha, you're definitely part of that. Her doctoral dissertation, called Right-Wing Sisterhood, examines the everyday mobilizations and violence of right-wing women in the Hindu nationalist movement and the Israeli Zionist Settler Project. It won the Best Dissertation Award by the European International Studies Association, and that's a serious, serious organization. She's also an established photographer and aspiring filmmaker. She was awarded the Rachel Tanur Memorial Prize in Visual Sociology by the ISA, which is the International Sociological Association. And she's currently learning and training to shape and build her visual and curatorial practice. As an award-winning educator, she's inspired by bell hooks and also writing scholarly work following up on this. She sees the classroom as the most radical space of possibility in the academy, where she shapes and reshapes her pedagogical practices in constant engagement and conversations with students and with feminist colleagues, colleagues of color in academia, in art, and in activism. She co-coordinated a decolonial and anti-racist pedagogical project called Mind the... Do I pronounce that BAM or B-A-M-A? I know, GAP, that provided mentoring and support to students of color in the university and created radical spaces of education, of joy, of politics, and of community within the university. Her engagement in what she tries to understand and what she does at Goldsmiths is based on three questions. One is on methods and methodologies and ethics of intimate feminist and queer ethnographic and visual research. And the second is on narrative writing, storytelling, and visual practice as research outputs and pedagogical tools. And the last one, in line with her position on education, is on larger questions on the politics of knowledge and knowledge production, and on the politics of gender, sexuality, race, class, and disability in higher education institutions and universities. There is more to it, maybe, but then you tell me what I missed, uh, Akansha. And um, I cannot give you the award in person now, but I can show it to you. Oh, no, I cannot, because I have already put it somewhere in an envelope to be sent to you. So <laughs> if you would be so kind to, um, to send Marina your ad the address that you would like to receive it, you will receive it as soon as possible, because it is made and it is there for you. 
So thank you very much for coming. So Akansha couldn't be here because they, she has Indian roots and there was a, a family sad situation in India where she had to go. And then you cannot be at several places at the same time. Um, so that's why unfortunately she has to miss us and we have to miss her. So we will, we will see to it that we meet another time, right? So thank you for everything you've done and yeah, we hope you enjoy the award. Yeah? Okay. Then I, I hope we have also our last awardee lined up on Zoom. How are the... Yeah. So, our last awardee is a Ukrainian uh, scholar. And when I asked around next to the people that had nominated her to the foundation, there were many that said there's no one who deserves more credit for bringing feminism and gender studies into Ukrainian public discourse than Tamara Marchenyuk. But maybe I yeah, wait a little bit, no? So that I'm sure she yeah, can hear. Can oh, you can hear it. Okay, that's good. Tamara is currently in Ukraine, so that, that explains maybe some of the problems of connection. It was also too complicated for her to like disrupt her visit uh, currently to Ukraine to come up and down for just the ceremony here. So, yeah, welcome Tamara. Thanks, thank you for, for making it possible to see you online. And did you hear what I started to say that no one but you deserves more credit for bringing feminism and gender studies into Ukrainian public discourse? And that's one of the reasons you get the award. Because already many years ago, uh, she recognized that it was a social readiness and openness to discuss issues and questions of feminism and gender studies. And she has brilliantly combined intellectual rigor and approachable, inviting presentations, especially through her highly popular online course um, of her 2018 book, Gender for All. And for this talent and dedication to teaching, she received several awards. But she also worked as a gender expert on a wide variety of topics for the European Union, for several foundations, for the Council of Europe. She's currently associate professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Kiev Mohila. And, um, but after evacuation from Kiev, Tamara was hosted by Free University Berlin and currently she's a visiting scholar at Leofana University in Germany. Right now, she's traveling and speaking through Ukraine and that's why she's not here. She's known for her writing and for her analysis of the role of women in the Euromaidan protests. In 2015, 2021, so over a long time, they conducted sociological studies called Invisible Battalion that demonstrated the successes and challenges of gender equality implementation in the Ukrainian armed forces, the status of female veterans and the problem of sexual harassment in the military. Her papers have been published in the Journal of Soviet and post-Soviet politics and society, problems of post-communism, sexuality and culture, and she authored chapters in a book also on the youthful reinvention of Ukrainians' cultural paradigm. Um, her sensitivity to the gender dimensions of living in a society at war has made her an essential voice in Ukrainian society in this 10th year of Russian aggression. So Tamara, we hope this award will strengthen you and your work and will give many other people hope and encourage them and um, yeah, similar to what I told Akansha, if you send uh, Marina your address, the award will be sent to the address where you are most likely to be able to pick it up and then we will be in touch again for further <laughs> information.
Thank you. I think we, we have a walking dinner to go to. I don't know what, uh, what, what you can go to, but <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, so now you've got to know a little bit these 14 wonderful people who also had no clue who the others were until now, we think. Um, so if we have a walking dinner, it means not that you have to walk, 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 walk all the time, uh, but that you have a chance to mingle and to, to talk to those persons that triggered your interest first, uh, hoping that you will meet the others later because they're all worthy of talking to for a long time. So if you have questions, you've also noticed these are critical people, all of them. So engage them in this and, uh, and ask if you think you can be useful to any of them, please, please. That's also a very good idea to do that. So yeah, that, that is it. And uh, we go and have dinner and mingle and talk and celebrate. And nobody is nervous anymore, I hope. <laughs> no, maybe the EVM. Marina, you might be a bit nervous, if I, but everything will be all right. So uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Casper. Thank you, two guys behind the mics that I have forgotten to ask their name. That's very stupid of me. I should have. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Misha, for your kind words at the beginning. We hope to be here again next year. And uh, thank you to my colleagues in the board. No? Um, that's it. No?